Right. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the opportunity. I <clears throat> many of you might be familiar with TDMPC. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit of the background of why I think TDMPC is important for robotics um, and related models, and some of the work that we've been doing on extending TDMPC, the algorithm itself, and also applying it to different problems in robotics. Um, and hopefully, if there's time, we can have a little bit of discussion also on the future of, of world models and, and robot learning. Um, all right, so I assume everyone is kind of familiar with what's happening in, in, in robot learning as a field. Um, there's been a lot of progress in the last few years, I think, in trying to scale up the methods that we've been working with and the data sets, much like what we've been doing in language and, and vision. Some early examples of this are the, the BC0 paper from 2021, where a group of researchers at Google, they uh, scaled up teleoperation. So tons of tons of hours of human teleoperation on a single robot, but it's kind of like a um, changing workspace where the task is, is language condition and the objects uh, in the scene might be changing between each episode. Um, and this is quite successful in showing that there's some uh, generalization capabilities, even with just pure celebration, um, because of this language conditioning. Now, the problem here is that celebration is uh, very, very expensive. <clears throat> so a recent project, RTX, has been trying to crowdsource this celebration a little bit, um, where there's multiple institutions that participate in this celebration um, procedure, and then you get up um, a much bigger data set than any individual institution could collect. Um, OpenVLA is a very recent work um, from many of the same people uh, that started the RTX project, where they train um, a, another BC policy on um, this OpenX data set. And they also show that there's quite some generalization to get just from scaling up the data set. Um, and all of these methods are uh, transformer architectures that do behavior cloning, meaning that uh, you're predicting the next action that was taken by the expert human um, celebrator. The bottleneck I see in these methods is that there, I think there's two components. One is that they require demonstrations, um, expert demonstrations. So you need to train humans to celebrate these robots. And depending on the setup, I think for these, you know, single arm, single gripper robots. Celebration is not that difficult. It still requires training, um, but it's doable. I think if you move to other robot embodiments, celebration gets much more, more complex when you scale up the um, number of joints that the robot has. So, and also like just in terms of human time and, and, and cost, I think also demonstrations are a button like, um, so ideally, we would have algorithms that could learn not just from demonstrations, but also uh, failures and like play episodes. The other thing is that these methods are taking images as input, maybe a language instruction, and then to predicting the next action to take. So there's no internal model in these models. Um, they don't have a sense of you know physics, and they also don't really plan. So every time at like an inference, they take a single observation, predict a single action execute that action and then see what happens. And then this is uh, the loop um, that runs auto aggressively. Um, this means there's no component of planning and <clears throat> no sense of you know planning multiple time steps ahead. This has implications in terms of how expressive the model is, but also things like safety can be really difficult to deal with when you just um, execute one action at a time and without any, any um, model of what's going to happen if you take that action. So these are some of the things that we're going to be discussing today. Um, the models that I'm going to be working with are based on RL. So this is moving away from the demonstrations and uh, behavior learning that people have been doing in the past. And we're going to look at some RL methods that also seek to scale up in a, in a similar way. Um, the general objective in RL is to find a policy that we usually call PI, uh, which is a mapping from state to actions. And once you find a policy such that this objective here um, on the slide is, is maximized. Um, and this is you know, the discounted sum of rewards from the initial time step that you initialize your policy and then until the end of the episode. And in many cases in, in RL, this is usually just until uh, infinity. Um, here, the states are coming from the environment. 
and the actions are coming from the policy. And this can be like deterministic or it can be stochastic. It doesn't really matter. Um, the reason that this is difficult is because the dynamics are usually not known. Um, so we don't have a uh, ground truth model of the real world. There also means that they're non-differentiable and they can also be stochastic. So taking the same action might always not always result in the same outcome. Um, the states and actions are also very often high dimensional, at least in the problems that I'm working with. Um, so we might be dealing with RGB images or point clouds or language conditioning or any other kind of high dimensional uh, robot information. Um, so given this framework, it's perhaps not surprising that learning a policy for each individual task that we want our robot to do um, is quite inefficient. So the models that I'm working with are looking at ways to like reframe this problem to be more task independent. And specifically, I'm working with world models, um, so model-based RL. The nice thing about world models is that they're not tied to a specific task. World models in general are also taking states as input, then they're predicting what will happen if you take certain actions. Um, so this is more like a self-supervised objective than imitation learning, which is purely supervised learning. Um, the nice thing about models is that they actually allow us to imagine what will happen in the future. So you can take a lot of environment interaction data, so real interactions. You can learn a model of the environment. This gives you a, an approximation of what would happen in the real world. And then you can use this approximate model to do uh, planning, for example, and say that if I take the sequence of actions, where will I end up? Or what will happen? Or what are the consequences of my actions? And this is quite useful for, for a lot of the downstream tasks that we're going to be looking at. So I think there's two competing paradigms of how to train world models. Um, it used to be that models would be taking the state from the environment um, usually like a proprioceptive state of your robot, and then predict the next proprioceptive state. Uh, so these are very, very explicit models. More recently, people have been taking more of a generative approach um, where you learn a latent dynamics model, um, but still using the same objective of predicting the, the next observation. Uh, Dreamer is a good example of this. It's a latent dynamics model that takes observations as input, so there might be RGB images, and then has a latent dynamics model, and then has a decoder that predicts the future observations. Um, so here, in the case of RGB images, it would be a RGB um, like pixel reconstruction loss. The models that we're proposing, the TDMPC models, are self-predictive, so they don't actually do reconstruction. Um, they're purely uh, latent models. So the way that they work is that they also take sequences observations as input, but they encode the first observation into a latent state, and then also roll out the model in the latent space. But the supervision here comes not from decoding, so TDMC doesn't have a decoder. Instead, the objective they were using is they were minimizing the difference in the latent space um, between the sequence of observations. And I'll get back to this with um, illustration later, but that's the general idea. Um, so self-predictive models are much closer to contrastive learning than to generative models. All right, so TDMPC, um, there's two terms. There's MPC and, and TD um, from TD learning. The model predictive framework is, at least in our case, is very data-driven. And it seeks to learn a model of the environment and then use that model for planning. And this is not like something that we propose. This is um, pretty widely used in, in the his, like especially in robotics. Um, the general idea here is that if you have a model of the environment, you can roll out, you can sample different action sequences, you can roll out your model, and then if you have a reward or a cost estimate function that is conditioned on that um, state or latent state in our case, you can estimate the RL objective using these rollouts. So you just sample a bunch of actions, you roll out your model with all of these uh, trajectories, and then you estimate this reward over the horizon that you're planning. Um, the downside of this is that you just find locally optimal trajectories. So you're very dependent on a long planning horizon in order to get um, estimates of the RL objective that actually um, approximate the true objective. 
And the problem here with uh, learned models, the problem with any MPC model is that it's expensive to roll out over long horizons. And specifically in the case of learned models, it also means that the error, estimation error from the model grows as you increase the horizon. On the other hand, you have TD learning. Um, TD learning doesn't learn a model of the environment. It just learns a value function, which is uh, globally optimal. And then we derive the policy by approximating the argmax of this value function in the case of continuous action spaces. And this is algorithms like DDPG and software to critic that, that you might be familiar with. The good thing is that we directly approximate the objective, the full RL objective. And the problem here, or like the negative, is that it's less expressive and that we don't do planning and we don't have a model of the environment. So there's much like uh, the BC algorithms, there's no way to um, enforce safety, for example. Um, but TDMPC here in broad terms is combining the both of the best of both of these worlds. So we do have a model, we do have short-term planning, and we also use the value function. Um, and I'll get back to that in a bit of how we combine these two things, um, but that's the gist of it. Now, a recurring theme in my research is that we want to build our algorithms that are you know, model-based and do planning, um, but we also want the algorithms that are scalable and robust. And here by robust, I mean that if you work with RL, you probably know that they're very, very sensitive and brittle to hyperparameters. Um, and often you need to do a lot of tuning and use a lot of expert knowledge on how to get your RL um, working for a specific problem. Um, so we want algorithms ideally that are much more, much more, more robust, meaning that you apply it to a new problem and it should work like reasonably well out of the box. We also want algorithms that are scalable, meaning that like in supervised learning and self-supervised learning, we do see that models that have more data and more parameters tend to do better on the task that we evaluate them on. And I think historically that has not been the case in RL. Um, RL algorithms usually don't scale. They're still most algorithms are our models are in the 1 million parameter range. Um, we haven't really seen much scaling like in other fields. Um, so we're going to try to solve this problem as well. Um, yeah, so I said I was going to be talking about TDMPC. I think I will mostly just talk about TDMPC2. Um, they're very similar architecturally and algorithmically. Um, there's a few implementation details. Um, I'll point out when there are differences. Um, otherwise, these are mostly the same algorithm. Um, but yeah, TDMPC2 here is a paper that we did um, last year and was um, presented in iClear this year. So the planning with TDMPC2 is very simple. Um, it works much like I discussed before. It's a sample-based planner that um, first we learn a model of the environment, and then we sample act actions, uh, sequences that we can evaluate using our model. Um, the way that it works in at test time is that we have an observation that we receive from the environment. We encode this into a, a latent state. And then condition on these actions that we sample, we roll out our model in the latent space. And then the return estimate here that we use to for optimization is a sum of reward over the time step that we do roll out the model. And then when we reach the horizon, instead of just truncating the estimate here, we use the value function. To, to bootstrap our estimate. And this gives us that something that in the short term, we're able to model the future time steps, and we do get pretty accurate reward estimates. And then either when we're satisfied with the return estimate or the computational budget is uh, reached in the case of real robots, um, we can use the value function to sort of like estimate what will happen in terms of reward from this time step onwards. I hope that is that is somewhat clear. Um, next, I'm going to show you how the training works. It's very very similar to the inference, and I think that's one of the uh, the nice properties of TDMPC is that training and inference is very very similar. So during training, we also we have sequences of observations and actions and rewards from our replay buffer. We assemble the first observation in a sequence. 
encode that into a latent state. And then we predict uh, three different quantities. We predict the optimal action to take. So this is not strictly necessary, but I'll come back to this in a bit. Um, we do predict the action. So this is a model-free policy condition on the latent state. Um, we predict the ground truth reward to receive from the environment. So this is a single step reward. And then we also predict the um, value using TD learning. And now we sample actions from the replay buffer. And we wrote out our model here. And we currently predict these quantities until we reach some horizon that may or may not be the same horizon as we use um, downstream. Um, the way that we learn the dynamics, as I hinted earlier, is that we minimize the difference in these latents. What this means in practice is that we have a sequence of observations and actions that we sample from the replay buffer. We take the first observation, so S1, and code that into the latent state. Then we roll out the model in this latent space. And then we take the future observations, S2 and S3 here, as our ground truth targets. And then because we don't have a decoder, we encode these observations with the same encoder, S1. And we get target latent states. And the loss here we do, that we design is the difference between the latents that we get when we roll out the model in the latent space and when, what we get if you take the ground truth observations and encode those into the latent space. Um, so if you're familiar with BYOL from self-supervised literature, it's kind of similar, except that here we actually have the um, dynamics model as well. The objective um, is fairly simple. So it just has three terms. Everything is learned end to end. Um, there's um, expectation here, which is over the data set. There's a sum here, which is over the number of time steps that we wrote out the model. And then uh, we have three terms at each time step. The first term here is the joint embedding prediction. This is um, the latent dynamics that I just described. So here we minimize the difference between the latent that we get when we roll out the model and the one that we get if we take the uh, ground truth state and encode that with the same encoder. The second term here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, um, but the second term here is the reward prediction. So this is the difference between the predicted reward and the ground truth reward. And then we have the value prediction, which is the, the TD loss here. So we have a predicted value. And then we have the TD target that we get from, this is a one-step TD target that we get um, using the ground truth rewards and then a TD, um, sorry, Q target. Um, and then we also have this policy prior. This is a model-free policy that we learn mostly for convenience. Um, it's here trained to learn the argmax of the Q function. And we use this to warm start our planning. Um, you can remove it and things will be fine as well, but it does speed up the planning process quite a bit. All right, I think we're okay on time. Um, this gives us a algorithm that can be used in quite a lot of different scenarios. Um, so we're gonna be looking at some online RL. Um, in this case here, we're also gonna be looking at offline RL. We'll be looking at RL with demonstrations. We're also going to look at some like pre-training and fine-tuning um, scenarios. So it's a very, very flexible algorithm. And for all of these different purposes, we don't really change the architecture or the objective in any way. Um, so it's, I would say it's quite flexible. In the case of online RL, we've had quite some success with very high dimensional problems. So this is an example of um, the dog from DM control that I believe TDMVC was the first algorithm to solve this task. Um, you initialize the policy with a no random policy and no data in the replay buffer. And the dog is just kind of like laying around on the floor. And then as you continue to optimize and collect more data, uh, TDMBC eventually learns a policy that can run quite fast. Now, if you look at the video on the right, I think this dog would not quite transfer to a real dog. It might break an ankle or something. Um, I think this is mostly an artifact of the simulator or the reward function. Um, but it does learn to run quite fast. And I think we're pretty close to optimal what can be done for this, for this task. Now, we evaluate TDMPC2 on more than 100 different tasks. Um, we're able to train TDMPC policies on all of these tasks without changing the high parameters. Um, so 
for some of these environments, actually, we had never tried running anything on these tasks before the results we reported in the paper. So we just we had our TMPC code base, we downloaded the environment code, ran it once, and those are the results we reported. Um, so I think it's pretty robust in terms of single task on NRL performance. Um, but also, as I mentioned, scalability is something that we're interested in. So we also decided to train TDMPC policies on all of these tasks at once, um, meaning one policy that can do all of these tasks one world model, I guess. The um, single task results, I'm just going to go over very, very briefly. Um, again, we do this with no tuning. We have about 100 tasks that we divide into these six um, task categories. We have a couple of baselines. We have stuff that's a critic, which is a model-free algorithm. We have a dreamer that predicts the raw observations. So this is the generative model approach. Um, then we have TDMPC1 here that does do high parameter tuning. So here we have tuned it for each of these um, task categories. And then we have TDMPC2 here, which is algorithmically very similar to TDMPC1, but we do improve some of the implementation details. And what we see here in general is that for tasks that are fairly easy and low dimensional in the action space, like DM control, all methods are kind of doing quite similar. But then we remove the tasks that are either very high dimensional in the action space or um, otherwise complex, like the locomotion in the bottom, the Maya suite, this is dexterous manipulation, or the pick YCB, which is a multitask um, pick and place task. We do see a big difference here in, in the performance. Now, I think what I'm most excited about is the scalability of TDFC2. It turns out that if you build an algorithm that doesn't require high parameter tuning, um, scaling is actually very trivial. So for the scaling experiments here, we also don't change the high parameters. This is still the same model, same algorithm, um, same high parameters. In this case here, we do instead of online RL, we do offline RL. So we have a data set of, I think, half a billion transitions across 80 different tasks, across different embodiments and different um, benchmarks. So we have DM control and meta world tasks, all of them in, in one um, model here. And so what we see here is that on the x-axis, we have model parameters and log scale. And then on the y-axis here, we have the normalized score. Um, TDM busy one doesn't really scale due to optimization instabilities. And I think this is quite common in RL. If you took another algorithm, say Softex or Critic, you would get curves that are very similar to this. Um, they tend to not uh, scale beyond the 1 million-ish range that usually uh, people use. Um, for TDMC2, we fixed some of these instabilities. And I'll give a couple of examples of what this um, might be. Um, but the gist of it is that given a fixed data set that is quite big um, and increasing the model size, we get better and better performance. And here we're able to scale from 1 million, which is what TDMPC1 used, to about 300 million, which is um, the largest TDMPC2 model that we trained. And we see kind of a saturation in the larger model sizes. And I think this is mostly because of the fixed data set size. So we kind of ran out of data in the end. Um, so why does TDMPC2 scale? Um, I'll show two examples. So first, we have an ablation here um, on the decision making, so the actor. We have on the left plot um, the curves here. We have online RL. So this is online RL in some of the most difficult tasks that we consider. Um, we see here the x-axis is the environment steps, and then the y-axis is normalized score. What we see is that the gray curve is if you learn a TDMPC world model, and then you just use the model-free policy that I mentioned that we also learn. So this is just using the model-free policy, but with the world model objective, the TDMPC objective. And it kind of saturates quite early, and it doesn't seem to be doing um, much better. You'll see that it kind of still increases, but it will take much, much longer to actually learn the, the optimal policy. If you use planning and you don't use the policy, just use the planning in TMPC. 
um, you see that it's actually achieving much better performance and convergence, but it's very unstable. You see there's a lot of variance in the performance across time. And this is because the policy kind of serves as a warm start approach. So it does reduce the amount of planning that we need to do and, and the stochasticity in the planning. Um, if you don't have the policy then and you don't increase the computational budget for planning, um, you see much big, big, bigger variance. I do believe that if you increase the computational budget of the planning, which we didn't do here, you would get something that is closer to the red. Um, but yeah, the red is if you do planning and you then warm start with the policy as well. You get something that is quite stable in terms of performance and it also converges to, to good policies. In the right plot here, you see the multitask experiments. So this is 80 tasks. And we see a very similar trend. So again, here, the policy kind of saturates early. And then the planning and planning with the warm start are quite similar in terms of performance. Um, I think this is, we have many ablations in the paper, but in general, you see this trend that the things that benefit online RL also benefit this offline multitask setting. I think just a quick clarification here, um, mm -hmm. because you're talking about convergence and these ablations. I, so these ablations are not just test time ablations or evaluation ablations where like you've trained, you, you've used the same training procedure, but at evaluation, you use either the policy or planning or both. Or is this actually somehow changing the way you're doing the training as well? Yeah, so I think that's a good question. So in the left plot, we do online RL. So here we either enable or disable the components both in training and downstream. Um, so in the case of the gray one here, we just use the policy when we interact with environment and collect data. And in the right side, we do offline RL. So here, it actually, the two settings are the same. So we don't actually use the planning when we just train the model. But then when we evaluate after training the model, we do use planning. And then you see this, um, this difference. So it depends a little bit on the setting. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think that the planning ablation explains why I think planning is important and why TDMPC2 seems to be scaling better than other algorithms that don't use planning. We also have ablations on things that like why are TDMPC2 better than TDMPC1? And I think this might not make sense if you're not familiar with these two algorithms. Um, but I think a big difference in the TDMPC2 implementation is that we use a lot more normalization in the architecture. We have one ablation on this here on the on the right, which again here is um, a curve with online RL and then a bar plot with, with offline RL. Um, here, the gray one is if you don't do any normalization in the architecture. So there's just linear layers and activation functions, and um, all of them MLPs. Um, you get the, the gray curve. If you add um, the sim norm here, which is a, a novel normalization that we propose, this is based on, on softmax, you get quite a lot better performance. And if you add both the sim norm normalization and also add layer normalization between all of the linear layers in the architecture, you get the, the red curve here, which is doing, again, considerably better. So I think the details of the specific normalizations are not super important, I feel. But the idea of using normalizations in your architecture um, turns out to be very, very important for stability and optimization. And this is something that um, especially uh, relevant when we scale up the architecture. Yeah, if you're interested in learning more about TMC2, we do open source pretty much everything. So all of the checkpoints in the single task and multitask experiments, the, the data set that we use to train the model and also the code for, for training and evaluation. Um, most of the experiments I showed were state-based, but we do have RGB experiments as well. And we also have multimodal experiments, and those are also available here. Um, I think on we have maybe five, 10 minutes left. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right. All right. Um, yeah, let me just quickly show some follow-up works that we have done uh, using the TDMC one and, and two models. Uh, one work that I think is particularly relevant for robot learning is this work. Uh, it's called Modem. The idea is that we want to learn world models, um, but we also have access to a handful of demonstrations. 
And this is, I think, quite common in real robot learning, where demonstrations are quite effective in terms of supervision. You get very direct supervision of, of the actions that you want the robot to take. Um, but they're very expensive to collect. And this is why I think we haven't seen as much work on you know, big robot foundation models as in other fields. Um, demonstrations are a really, really big bottleneck. On the other hand, the kind of autonomous interaction that RL allows us to do is cheap in terms of supervision. So we can just let our robot run overnight, and hopefully we'll have a policy by the morning. Um, but depending on the tasks that we want to do and the kind of reward functions that we're using, um, exploration can be really, really challenging. And the kind of real robot environments that I tend to work with just use sparse rewards um, because it's easy to you know, train a success detector versus hand engineering rewards. Um, so this means that random exploration is quite inefficient, but but cheap. And then human demonstrations are very expensive, but um, give much more direct supervision. The idea here is that we can collect just a few demonstrations. In this paper, we just use five demonstrations collected from a human. And we can use that to initialize our autonomous interaction. So we built here a TDMPC architecture that learns, that has a buffer from the environment, so it does do online interaction, but then it also has a demonstration buffer with those five demonstrations. And then every time we make an update, we sample 50-50 from the demonstrations and the replay buffer. Um, so this is a way to get very, very direct supervision of what the task is supposed to be and which parts of the state action space are interesting, but then also allow the algorithm to improve over the demonstrations that I've seen. And because we just have five demonstrations, um, training just the BC policy on those demonstrations would not give you a very generalizable policy. Um, so this is kind of blending the, the two paradigms. Um, we This is from last year. We've been able to deploy it on real robots. Um, so here we have uh, set up here with a, a robot in the case on the left, it's a dexterous hand, and then the other ones, it's two fingers. We have uh, sparse rewards. We have quite a lot of randomization in the object, so the objects can be anywhere in the bin. And we also have the observation space here is three cameras, RGB cameras, with 224 by 224 resolution. So fairly high dimensional observations and high degree of randomization and very, very sparse supervision. Um, but with just five demonstrations and one hour of autonomous interaction, not counting the recess, we do get policies that learn these tasks um, pretty well. I think these are these are examples of, of after one hour of training. Um, if you look at the success rates, I think we're, there's still definitely room for improvement. But if you compare um, this approach with the interaction that we call modem v2, if you compare that to just taking the demonstrations that we collected and then doing BC on those demonstrations, you get much less success. So it does seem that having demonstrations can really help your RL process. And it does improve a lot more than just if you just do imitation learning. Um, so I think this is especially promising if you have a setup where you might be able to afford maybe more than five demonstrations. Um, you collect however many demonstrations you can. And then after that, you allow your RL algorithm to kind of like iterate and fine tune it, it itself. And you have something that um, is more scalable and also potential for performance that is better than what the initial demonstration data set would give you. Um, this, I think I'm going to skip over. Um, I just want to discuss very quickly also some of the new work that we've done on humanoids. This is also with TMPC. And humanoids are quite interesting because they're high dimensional, both in the observations and the actions. So here we consider um, full body control. So there's 56 joints in these humanoids. Um, it's a very high dimensional action space. And also the observation space here is both proprioceptive information and also an RGB camera. Um, so quite high dimensional observations as well. And this problem is interesting because when you have very high dimensional observation and action spaces and you have rewards that are fairly simple, say like moving forward with high velocity, there's actually many different policies that achieve the same reward. Um, as an example here on the slides, even though the policies might achieve the same reward, they look very, very different from each other. Um, 
And this is tricky because it's not easy to specify sometimes the behaviors that you want out of your policy in, say, in, like in code or a natural language. But having demonstrations of what kind of behavior you usually want um, is much easier to collect. We train TDMC2 here on a mocap data set. So we have a big mocap data set of humans doing all kinds of motions. I think it's about, about 1,000 trajectories, I think, of, of humans doing um, everyday motions. We retarget that to our um, yellow Mujoko humanoid here. And then we pre-train the TDMC2 model um, to follow these, these human data. And we end up, I'm not going to go over the technical details. There's a bit more to it. Um, but by doing this pre-training on the human data, we end up with policies that solve the task, um, achieving high reward, but also has um, motions that look much more natural because of the pre-training. And here are examples of, of policies that on the left have the human data, and the, the right one here is just TDMPC. Um, there's more examples here of some other tasks. So you see that in general, like they actually run with the same velocity. Um, so they're similar in terms of reward, but in terms of naturalness of the behavior or humanness of the behavior, um, the one on the left is, is much more natural. An example of a task here with stairs. You see that if you just do RL optimization, you end up with something that just roll up, rolls up the stairs, but it's actually rolling at the same velocity as if you're running up the stairs. Um, yeah. We ask a lot of humans of, um, we show these videos to lots of humans and ask what they prefer. And unsurprisingly, humans tend to prefer um, policies that are trained with human data. So just to summarize what we've been discussing, um, TDMPC, I believe, is pretty robust in terms of hyperparameters. It's uh, scalable, quote unquote, and it can learn from quite diverse data. Um, We've seen just doing on RL. We've seen multitask offline RL. We've seen some demonstration augmented RL. We have also seen um, RL with kind of like external data sets, like uh, the mocap data set. In general, demonstrations do accelerate learning quite a bit. So I don't think it's either we want to do imitation learning or we want to do RL. I think naturally we will want to do something that is a blend of the two. If we have demonstrations, we should definitely leverage those. Um, but also, RL does give us a framework for, for going beyond the demonstrations. And something that is not talked about that much is that demonstrations also can augment the behavior or the, the bias, the behavior of our policies. So in a way, it, it decreases the search base of the policies that we want um, to achieve in the end. So in terms of like safety, for example, or human-robot interaction, I think it's important to have policies that are not just solving the task, but solving it in a task that looks natural uh, to humans. Um, the reason that I put scalable in, in quotes here is that I think there's still an open question of how much this approach will scale to, say, um, data sets that are 100 times bigger or 1,000 times bigger, like we've seen in, in uh, LLMs and VLMs. So I do think that's still an open question, but we definitely have made quite a lot of progress in the scaling. And I would be interested you know, to see in the future how much more we can scale this self-supervised world model approach compared to behavior cloning. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Thank you so much for that, uh, Nicholas. And thanks for giving us uh, a preview of all that new work that's coming through. Um, so we'll, we'll go to questions now. Uh, I already see a couple in the chat so and someone's hand up, so I'll, I'll start getting through those. Um, uh, Tando in the chat asks, could you go a bit into if it is a good idea to build a SQL model for both puppeteering and tracking with a joint distribution rather than that of two models for the human control of paper? Mm. Yeah, so this is a bit more technical yeah. than, than the slides that I had, um, but let me just maybe I do have those slides somewhere. Uh, these. Yeah, so it is the way that we do the pre-training. It's kind of like a hierarchical approach. Um, I think the nice thing about the hierarchy in the way that we do it is that it doesn't change the reward of the policy. So like performance is pretty much the same, but we do get the benefit of pre-training. 
Um, the way that it works is that we have two agents. We have a tracking agent that learns to track the a reference motion, and then we have a high-level agent that produces those reference motions. And this is both done in in a high, like low-dimensional 3D space. Um, so this is why we have like a tracking agent and a puppeteering agent, which is a high-level agent. Um, if you're familiar with Pin Pinocchio, I think this is a, um, a good analogy. Um, I think in terms of having a single agent, that would be quite interesting. The um, reason that we split the hierarchy here is that the low-level agent doesn't take RGB observations as input, and the high-level agent can, and in our case, it does. Um, so there might be differences also in the observation space, not just the action space of, of the two agents. Another benefit of this is that we actually just train a single tracking agent, and we reuse that in all of our experiments. So we have this mocap data set. We learn a low-level CDMPC on this mocap data set, and we use that for all of our experiments. Um, so actually, I, I just trained this model once. It took about two weeks to train. I did that in February, and then for the next like several months for this paper, all of the experiments were done with that same agent. So I think in terms of like practicality, having this hierarchy and that you're just able to reuse the same agent again and again, I think that's uh, quite practical. Um, so yeah, I think that's more or less my take on that. Um, you could definitely train it also jointly, and you could also have more like abstract action spaces. In this case, we just use three um, positions. You could also have something that is like a learned action space. Um, but that does increase the dependency between these two agents. I hope that answers the question. Um, James um, asks, uh, I think you may have mentioned this, but maybe maybe more clarification. Uh, are there any are any of the TDMPC2 ta test tasks uh, that use sparse reward? Yeah. I think that's a good question, because I do get that question a lot. Um, we use these standard benchmarks. So there's um, yes. So we use these benchmarks. There's a DM control, a meta world, and Maya suite, and, and many skill. And most of these, so we don't change any of the tasks, um, but some of them do have sparse rewards already um, by design. So there's a few DM control tasks that are kind of like reaching tasks or simple manipulation tasks that do have sparse rewards. Um, so some tasks definitely do, but most of them do have dense rewards. And that's just by design in these benchmarks. Um, I think that's for the benchmark results that we have. For the real robot experiments, um, we never use dense rewards. So this is all sparse. And it's all done by either heuristics or using training like a simple classifier <clears throat> to classify success or not success. So I'd say that definitely works with sparse rewards, but you do run into a lot of the problems that other algorithms do that if you just do random exploration, um, it's very unlikely that it's going to succeed unless your task happens to be simple enough that you know, like a random policy might solve it sometimes. Um, and that's why in a lot of the real robot experiments that we do, we actually don't do RL from scratch. Either we rely on a little bit of offline RL data, or we use um, a few demonstrations to to kind of like kickstart this process. Um, so yeah, I would say that there's nothing particularly interesting that we've done in like exploration in CDMPC. It's using um, just standard like MPC and, and maximum entropy. So we mostly rely on more like data-driven approach to exploration. Um, but I think there's a lot of other work on exploration for RL that you could also apply to TDMPC. Um, yeah, that's kind of an open problem. Thank you. So Matt, uh, Matt asks, actually, one, one thing before I continue. There were some hands raised before, and I can't see them. So. Um, Maybe maybe those people switched to uh, switched to the chat instead. But if, if you did have your hand raised, please try to raise it again. If, if you actually want your question answered, and it's not on the chat. Um, so uh, Matt asks, can you clarify a bit about how the planner works? For example, you mentioned random sampling. Do you also do local optimization? 
Yes. Um, I don't think it's explained that explicitly in the slides here, but it, we use MPPI, so um, which is like a weighted version of CEM. So we do initially we sample a bunch of trajectories from a very wide distribution, um, and then we evaluate those returns, and then we iteratively fit like a Gaussian distribution over the, the return estimates. Um, so that after a few iterations of planning, you end up with a Gaussian that is kind of narrow, hopefully, um, near the, the optimal action trajectory. And then we use the receding horizon MPC, meaning that we um, converge to this tra trajectory of actions. We just execute the first one, and then when you receive feedback from the environment at the next step, you can sort of replan. Um, but you could also execute an open loop, meaning that you just plan for say five or 10 steps, and then you just execute those five and 10 steps in, in one go without using the feedback. Um, but obviously using feedback tends to give you better performance, especially when the dynamics are kind of complex to model. Um, we've been able to do fairly long horizon planning without like just open loop. So I had an example, I don't think I have the slides for this, um, but we did train the TDMPC world model on Cardpole, and we just trained it with three-step prediction. Um, so the model is trained to predict three steps ahead. But in our test time, you can just give it the, the card ball here, the first observation. Um, you can give that the first observation of the episode to the model, and then you can ask the model to plan for the entire episode, which is in DM control, that's 500 steps. Um, so there's about 100 times more than what it was trained for. And it still gives you a um, close to optimal reward for, for card ball. It learns to balance just um, open loop. So there does seem to be evidence that definitely the horizon that you use in planning and training doesn't have to be the same. They're going to be quite different. Um, and as long as the model is you know, trained with enough data that it's able to model the dynamics pretty well and the task is fairly simple, then you can actually um, do completely open loop control. Yeah. That's super cool. Thank you. Uh, Anton, I'll answer your question in the chat directly. Let's jump to the next one. Um, Michael asks, uh, do you use predictive error to guide exploration? Um, we don't. So there's actually a, yeah, I don't have the slides for this either. But we do, we have one paper where we do offline RL. So um, in the case of offline RL, you actually want the opposite of exploration, you want the predictive error to be small, or like the uncertainty of the predictions to be small. Um, so we do have two papers, actually, where we do offline RL, where we don't change the objective, like offline RL people usually do. Um, so usually, you will learn like a conservative Q function or something in the case of model free RL that explicitly is pessimistic in the high value um, trajectories. Um, for TDMPC2, you can train it without any conservatism. So you just train TDMPC with the online RL objective in the offline setting. And then at test time, you can use the estimates that you get when rolling out the model. You can use, you can do some like uncertainty quantification with this so that you, when you do planning, you can adaptively downweight the trajectories that look overly optimistic compared to the neighbors. Um, that's an example of what we have done to kind of discourage the extrapolation errors um, in the offline setting. But you could also use that for exploration if you do the opposite and say that during training, for example, you want to explore the areas where the model is very uncertain. Um, that could be another direction of doing that. Um, it's not something that I've tried, but it, it definitely seems um, reasonable. Tan, uh, Michael says, thanks in the chat. Tan Do uh, asks, uh, it's just a follow-up on the puppeteer question. Could you give your take on the challenge of scaling up to the MPC up to here? Scaling up TDMC for puppeteer. Do you need clarification on the question? Yeah, maybe just a little bit. 
Tan, if you could uh, drop some clarification on the question in the chat or, or on me. Uh, Uh, you're muted, Alex. Okay. Uh, well, Tan's gotten back to us. So, uh, okay. He says, I met Pep Puppeteer. The RL is clearly the bottom there. Is that clear enough for you, Nicholas? Um, let me try to answer. I think, as I understand it, the question is how to scale Puppeteer to, say, bigger data sets or more tasks. Um, and I think in terms of the low-level agent, I'm not concerned because the low-level agent is trained on the external data set. And we use a you know existing mocap data set that is quite popular in academia. Um, it's not you know big enough that it contains all human motions, but it contains a lot of them. And we do see there's some evidence that it generalizes a little bit beyond that. Um, so if you were to learn even more diverse or even, you know, better uh, human policies, I think scaling the low-level policy by just collecting more mocap data, I think that would work quite well. When it comes to the high-level task, we learn individual high-level puppeteering agents for each task using RL. Um, so that's obviously a bottleneck if you want to do run this on a real humanoid, for example. Um, it would be interesting to instead of training the high-level agent for each task, you could also pre-train the high-level agent, maybe in simulation, and then you could like fine-tune in the real world. Or if there's another way to get uh, real robot data on a real humanoid, um, you could also just use that for pre-training. Say if you have a few demonstrations that you have um, collected on a real humanoid, you could use that to bootstrap the RL process. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's quite interesting, um, but definitely, um, open question. Okay, I, I don't know. Thanks from Tan. Uh, I don't have any more questions lined up, so I think I'll... Oh, here we are, Alec, Alec, Alexandre. Yes, uh, thanks for the talk, Nicholas. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on how the encoder is trained. Because uh, it's kind of mysterious for me. From what I understand, the loss is aiming at minimizing the error uh with the predicted latent representations but these representations they also use the encoder that we want to optimize so is it a source of instability at some point do you use any trick to stabilize that yeah i think there is that's a very interesting question um so the encoder here is learned end to end together with everything else so it does use the supervision of the latent dynamics prediction and it also uses the supervision of the rewards for training and i think if we look at byol which is like the most similar representation learning um, in literature byol also has this instability <clears throat> at least in theory but it doesn't seem to happen in practice and there's a couple of tricks to avoid that i think the layer normalization plays a role in that it kind of stabilizes the process a little bit um, BYL has this target um, that is like a moving average of the encoder that it uses to sort of have very like more slow moving and stable targets. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's what TDMPC one does. TDMPC two doesn't have the targets anymore because um, it seems that at least for in the case of like world modeling, it seems that the target is not necessary as long as you just decrease the learning rate of the encoder with respect to all of the other components. Um, so that means the targets are still moving slower than the dynamics model itself. And that seems to be more or less the same performance, but obviously with less uh, memory. So I'm not sure if, that's what, if that would transfer to traditional BYRL methods, if you could also just remove the target and reduce the learning rate. Um, but at least in the case of TDMPC, that works. And another reason that representations might be um, more stable is also because we have the reward prediction. So BYRL has this issue that if you just rely only on the latent prediction, um, there are trivial solutions in that an encoder just maps everything to a constant that would give yeah, you a exactly. loss of zero. 
But here we also use reward prediction so that like those solutions will not be valid anymore because um, we do need representations that are predictive of the reward. Yeah, so we could imagine, yeah, so that's the thing I was missing, the, the reward prediction, but we could imagine that some strange thing would happen if we enter some kind of uh, difficult setting where we have a very sparse reward and all the prediction is zero except uh, at the very uh, end of the of the task. But uh, yeah, I was thinking about this uh, problem of collapsing to, uh, for example, single dimension and a, a single uh, latent uh, representation where we wouldn't learn anything, but I okay, understand how the, the reward prediction works now. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I should add that I think the reward prediction helps, but you could, I've tried removing that and like so not learning reward free well models and you still get representations that make sense. So it doesn't, it doesn't diverge and doesn't give you a trivial solution. But the representations are not as good for control. And I think this is a very common problem with world models. Um, say, like Dreamer, for example, if you remove the reward prediction um, supervision, you also get world models that are qualitatively worse for control. And I think this is because rewards are not necessarily just preventing the collapses, they also bias the representation towards learning things that are useful for the task. Um, so, generative models, they tend to like do pixel prediction. And if you don't have reward prediction, then they will. Um, treat all pixels as equal. Um, whereas if you have the reward prediction, then the latent representation tends to focus on pixels that are you know, correlated with the reward. And I think that's also the case for TDMC2. And we can learn these latent dynamics, but with the reward prediction in there, we get supervision that um, kind of biases the latents towards things that are useful for the task. Um, so yeah, I think that's also a component um, that I just wanted to mention. OK, thanks, very clear. All right, well, uh, we've reached the, the end of the hour. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much, Nicholas, uh, for your time. Thanks for answering those questions. Uh, it's a great talk. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure everyone else did. Um, so uh, everybody, uh, thank you as well uh, for being a great audience. And uh, until next time.